Hello. Hi. I'm Ali. Salam. Can you can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I can hear you very much. I can hear you fine. Hello. Salam. Salam. Can hear us. Hello. Can you hear us? Okay, Peter to Salam can solve the problem with the voice. Uh, let me ask our uh, audience uh, if can you hear uh, me well? Um, someone asked about English. Yes, we will try to stick to English uh, in almost all the. Uh, yes, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we can see some guests from. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, welcome everyone to the hour. This webinar, FRCS Ophthalmology uh, webinar, and I wish you will like it, and I wish you get benefit from it. So we first, before starting, we want to have an idea about who are you. So, and another important question is, what exactly the question is in your mind that you really want want us to answer in this uh, webinar? So I'm asking you, please, to write on the, on the comment first. Uh, what's your level? For example, you had FRCS part one, part two, you don't have FRCS at all. And what's your main question that you wanted to uh, to answer in this uh, in this webinar? So please feel free to write this in the uh, in the comments, please. You have some uh, friends from India, some friends from Egypt, that's interesting. Have other friends from Libya, FRCS two. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm finding uh, friends from all over the world. Uh, yeah. Chipping in. Okay, so we have, we have a we have yeah. that, that's, that's Iraq it. as well and Libya. Yeah. Okay, we have a question: How to start the process preparation? That's interesting. And what are the sources to study? Okay, that's an interesting question also. All right, we have we have such a um, uh, variety of people coming from. Um, all over the world, actually. Uh, I'm seeing Libya. I'm seeing. Uh... Okay. So, What's any on? any questions before we start? Any specific questions about what people would want to get out of this? How to prepare for OSCE Viva exam? Tricky point. Friend from Bangladesh. I can be prepared for OSCE or Viva exam. Other question. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. okay. So let me first introduce my friend, Dr. Ahmad Salam. Dr. Ahmad Salam, actually, we we are friends a long time ago. We are friends since 2003. Uh, actually, uh, I started taking courses for FRCS, for my FRCS back to 2003. Dr. Ahmad Salam uh, is associate professor of retinal EVIDIS in the States, and he's got a bit retina also. He used to work in the United Kingdom till 2016. He had an MD, PhD in Cairo. I also has ICO, FRCO, it was actually an examiner uh, in, in many royal colleges. And um, uh, also he has a certificate of medical education from Bristol. And of course he is holding FRCS courses back to 2003. Yeah. Dr. Ahmad Abafudra, my other friend, is a current PSC fellow. He's a lecturer in Manchester University. Uh, of course he is a royal college surgical uh, tutor, he's a PLAB examiner. As a Master of Ophthalmology, ICO, FRCS Glasgow, ICO Fellowship Award. He worked in Egypt, Qatar, and the United Kingdom. He's currently in the United Kingdom, actually he's talking to us from the United Kingdom since 2014. Uh, and we have met uh, we have met together back to 2007 when I worked for a few months in Qatar. So nice meeting uh, you, old friends. And let's try in this night to help uh, people who uh, are eager to, to uh, uh, to take a first test or are asking to travel to the United Kingdom or uh, you're asking about how to about the United Kingdom exam. So let's try to help them. Uh, and the mic is with you, Dr. Adam Asu. So I am humbled today to be in the presence and to share with uh, Dr. Uh, Ayman Ghanemi and Ahmed Salam this, uh, this, this webinar. Ever since I started preparing for the uh, FRCS exam in 2008, these two names were already carved in stone and nearly anyone heard about their uh, their courses and their help and their introduction and their one-on-one -on -one work that they do uh, uh, in, in, many, uh, in many areas around the world. And then they started to introduce some online work as well, 
which helped a lot of people, uh, certainly helped me. And I certainly fondly remember uh, Dr. Ghanemi's visit to my house in, 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 in Qatar and doing some, um, uh, some mock uh, trials just before my exam in, in, in Qatar. So uh, uh, um, it's, uh, I think many people heard about the, these, these two guys already who uh, were monumental in giving, in delivering uh, very useful courses. Uh, in addition, I'm an Ghanemi is an MD in FRTF and an honorary uh, fellow of the ICO. He's a consultant ophthalmologist in the Memorial Institute for Islamic Research, a consultant ophthalmologist in Maghrabi Eye Hospital in Cairo and previously in, in, in Saudi Arabia in Jeddah as well. Uh, he's an MD in ophthalmology since 2009, fellow of the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, University of Miami in 2008-2009. He passes both ICO uh, clinical and the advanced one uh, as an honorary uh, certificate as well in 2010. He's an ICO coordinator in Saudi Arabia since between 2010 and 2012. He was a CME director in Maghrabi Hospital Jeddah uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia between 2010 and 2012. He secured the FRCS in Glasgow since 2005 and was organizing courses since 2005 as well. His first online FRCS course instruction uh, in, uh, 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 delivery with Dr. Ahmed Salam was since 2006, if you believe it. So these two guys have been doing this since 14 years and they certainly helped me personally when I started going for these exams back in the days of Yahoo and Yahoo groups, uh, industrial our age, but I'm younger than them, so I can I can say that. And uh, back to you, Ayman. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, let me see this piece of yeah. to, to, to remember some old days about since 2003, and we are in the courses. Uh -huh. I remember those old days and mock exams, holding some mock exams uh, in my clinic 2005. And we started this Yahoo group back to 2006, the FSS uh, Yahoo group. And this was one of the screenshots from the slides where we were using the online uh, through Yahoo uh, Messenger, if you can remember this Yahoo Messenger. It's a long time for the see how things are getting fast. And then we passed through the Ophthalmic MD website with our friend, Dr. Ahmad Sharawi. And then we passed through, any, uh, so met through many uh, courses face-to-face uh, uh, in my cl in my clinic, whether to step two or step three, and finally maybe up to 2018. So it was long, and then back to 2020, we are back again, and because we are eager again to help more and more people in their journey to the FRCS. So um, a brief a brief history about the UK exam. So. We know that they were all married together, uh, the all three exams, they are all uh, interchangeable and they were um, kind of the same, uh, more or less with many similarities until a few years back. But nowadays they are a bit separate and each exam would give you something different. So there is an exam in Glasgow, uh, there is an exam in Edinburgh and there is an exam in London. Uh, there is also an MRCS in Dublin as well, which is a little bit less. Uh, known, so yes. depends what 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 your goal is will will dictate which exam you might be going for. So the ICO exams are now nearly three three parts. There are the visual sciences, there is the optics refraction instruments, there is clinical ophthalmology for so the four, and there is the advanced exam which allows you the fellow uh, of the ICO. Now, what each exam? So this is this is this is a post nominal in itself. If you if you finish all four parts, you are awarded the post nominal of the fellow of the International Council of Ophthalmology or the FICO. And each part of these exams helps as well in getting exempted from other parts, which you can use it as that if you so wish. But the main advantage of the ICO exam is it's international. So you can have all four parts actually in different parts of the world. And certainly I know it's delivered in Egypt and in India. For Glasgow exam, it's three parts. There is the basic part, there is step two, which is the MCQ and a problem solving written, and the clinical OSCE. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can hear you yeah. now. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's oh, great. Oh, welcome, Dr. Salam. <laughs> Join the party. I think your sound is coming okay. to me interrupted, so you carry on, Ahmed. Okay, I let him know and I'll carry on. I've let him know now that he's heard. So back to what we're saying. So 
the ICO Part 1 exempts you from Part 1 in Glasgow. I think mo most people know this. The ICO Part 2, uh, of course, Part 1, including the optics and refraction. Now, the clinical exam exempts you as well from the written part of the Glasgow exam. So all you need to do, and that's certainly what I did when I did my Glasgow exam, is I, I've done back home my ICO Part 1 and Part uh, 2, which is the clinical. And when I went to Glasgow, all I had to worry about is the OSCE, and, uh, and that's it, because I've already finished the first two parts. And the Glasgow exam allows you to register with the DMC. Now, recently, the Edinburgh exam as well can allow you that, but there is a caveat with that that we will discuss later on. But the Glasgow exam has always been and will continue to be for the, as far as we know, for the foreseeable future, allows you to skip the PLAB and it gives you a postgraduate qualification as well that can help you find uh, more advanced jobs in ophthalmology in, in the UK. Hey, Kevin, try if Dr. Salam can, can talk now. Dr. Salam, you ever make a trial to, uh, to, to speak? Yes, please. Right, the next slide. Hi, I hope you can hear me well. I'm sorry, I, uh, it's weird. Yeah, I'm having um, yeah, weird internet problems here. I'm not sure why, but uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, you can hear me, I think. <laughs> Yes, so uh, for the Edinburgh exam, there are three parts, part A and part B and part C. As you would imagine, part A is the basic test, and it's an MCQ, and part B is an optics refraction module, an OSCE, uh, as well as a clinical um, test where you see patients and you're asked at a more of a basic level about the findings that you see. Then part C, uh, is a, a repeat of the OSCE, but on more advanced level, and also there's an oral exam. Uh, when you finish part A and part B, you have the MRCS Edinburgh. When you have, go for MRCS Edinburgh, part C, that's where you get the fellowship of Edinburgh. Things are changing a little bit, I'll tell you how. Uh, but before that, let me tell you that ICO, if you do the standard ICO exams, which are the basic um, or the vision sciences, the uh, optics, as well as the clinical ophthalmology exam, then you automatically will get granted the MRCS Edinburgh uh, as per the new collaboration. The caveat is here. The caveat is that when you come to GMC registration, <clears throat> then uh, GMC would say, okay, well, you have MRCS Edinburgh, but you reached to this through ICO equivalents, uh, equivalent exams, you cannot actually get registered with a GMC. And now the issue becomes that you have to sit the Part C um, <clears throat> Edinburgh. Uh, so to get the FRCS and also to be able to register with a GMC. So that's the situation. But yes, so you can actually get G GMC registered um, if you, um, uh, if you uh, get the FRCS Glasgow straight, or if you get FRCS Edinburgh. And for that, you will need to do the three parts or to do the ICO exam, standard, which is the vision sciences, basic and clinical ophthalmology. Then you sit the ICO advanced exam, which again is a multiple choice question. Then now you go do the um, third part of the MRCS Edinburgh, and now you get the FRCS Edinburgh. So slightly a bit convoluted way. And then the next question, really, which was, would be uh, important is, uh, okay, which one is better, Edinburgh versus Glasgow? So my point before I hand over to uh, Dr. Abdul Maksud is, I think MRCS, I think going the Edinburgh route is better. The reason I think this is you're doing four MCQ exams from your country. You don't need to travel anywhere. By the end of the four exams, you have a very strong foundation of ophthalmology. And then you sit an OSCE oral exam. And actually, the, the uh, I have very good connections with the uh, University of Edinburgh and the Royal College of Edinburgh uh, working on education materials together is a very reasonable college. So if you 
really at a good standard, you will definitely pass. And then you get the FRCS Edinburgh and you'll be able to register with the GMC. I think it's slightly longer, but if you think about it, all the exams, you can set them from your home and then you have one, which are four and multiple choice exams. And then you have one main clinical uh, OSCE exam to sit in a college where things are very reasonable and if you're really good, you will pass. So I think my uh, friend, Dr. Abdul Maksud may have a different uh, view. So, so Ahmed, we back to you. Of, yeah, thank you. So um, uh, we thought of uh, doing it that way to try and balance. Uh, that might be a question that uh, some of our viewers are, are thinking of. So basically to come to the UK, if someone is wanting to work in the UK, they can either go to CLAB, which is a very basic exam, uh, professional linguistic assessment. It mainly uh, means that you have the basic knowledge and language uh, and communication skills to uh, work in the UK market. Now, if you want something, if you don't want to go through CLAB and you certainly want to have a more ophthalmology related exam uh, under your belt, which would allow you as well to get uh, more advanced jobs in the UK market, then perhaps you'd be thinking how I get what the GMC call an accepted postgraduate qualification. Now, of these, of the ophthalmology exams, we have two. The ICO in itself is not something accepted by the GMC. You have to either have Glasgow or Edinburgh. Now, Edinburgh has, since 2018, as it has been equated and they went into collaboration with the ICO, which is certainly a good thing because it allows you to do more exams at home. But you, at some point, you will have the ICO exam cleared and even the MRCS Edinburgh cleared because it is now equated. You can get uh, the degree without doing any OSCE. But you will be in a situation where you have both the ICO and the Edinburgh exam and the Edinburgh uh, uh, certificate, but you cannot register with GMC without coming and having an OSCE exam. Uh, so it's something new and it's something still developing as to how they will develop this, as far as I know. While the Glasgow exam is, has been always classically agreed no matter when you took it or when you got your certification, you will need to pass the, the basic ICO exam and the clinical uh, bit and that's it. And then you come just once for uh, an exam uh, in, uh, it doesn't have to be in the UK. There are many other countries in the world, uh, uh, maybe several other countries in the world that can, that can deliver it. I always advise, always go to the website and check the most updated information. I cannot stress this enough because it changes. If you ask someone what they did, they will give you their own experience, which is good, but it's better always to check the most recent updates on website. So as it stands now, the GMC still accept Glasgow and it always accepted Glasgow. So it seems to me the more sensible approach, it is you will have to you do all the written, all the MCQ bits, uh, the basic, the optics and refraction and the visual and the clinical sciences before you leave your country. And then you come once to several other countries, including Glasgow itself, where you go through the just the written exam and then the OSCEs and you're cleared. Uh, and there is no ifs and buts about it. We know that it works and it always has been an easy and not, not an easy, but a fairly straightforward way to gain GMT registration. Uh, and that's why I feel at the current environment, still the Edinburgh ICO marriage uh, or partnership, let's say, is not still yet very clear what the GMT will do with it and just watch the space on the GMC website and it will tell you what to do. Or you can take the Glasgow exam and you're certainly eligible mm. for GMC registration. Um, and uh, Mr. Lunaini, back to you, please get us to the next item in our discussion. Yes, um, um, I, I myself, I myself uh, believe, believe in Glasgow. I think it's always straightforward, it's always there, it's always understood. Uh, still, still having MRC and <coughs> From home, it's very, it's very, uh, it's very interesting. Um, actually, it was a surprise that uh, you can take the ICO exams from from your home country, and then you just get MRCS. But the point is that you don't get yet to to GMC. Uh, they need to a face to face. Yeah. Salah, I want you to take your comment about uh, about this point. You worked in the UK. You, you are already still now in, com in, con in connection with the Edinburgh, with the College in Edinburgh. I, I, I mean, I would, uh, I would vote for uh, for Edinburgh because of the reasons I've discussed. I think it's uh, it just 
it's it looks like it's convoluted, but if you think about it, these the previous like the preliminary exams are all you can sit from your home country, um, and then you go for the OSCE uh, finally when you're re ready. Yeah. And I think the OSCE is very sensible uh, in Edinburgh. Um, that's my point, and the clinical exam. Uh, there is a point coming, yes, and this is really, it's, it's, it's probably coming out. Edinburgh is moving away from face-to-face -face exam. It might be all uh, become video surgery, like video-based. You see like surgery, um, uh, operate, like operations, uh, videos, and you see uh, OSCEs, there will be use of simulation. So they may be moving away from using any face-to-face -face with patients and even simulated patients. It's not 100% final yet, but there is actually a wave going this way and it's probably most likely going to happen. Okay. Okay. Okay, let, let, let's, let's check the questions on the comments. Uh, One question was, is surgery mandatory? Uh, if, if, is it mandatory that you work, uh, you've been doing certain surgery? And I guess my answer to this is, of course, the examiner would not ask you to show him or her how you do a surgery. As long as you know how it's done, as long as, so for example, if the examiner asks you how you manage vitreous loss during cataract surgery or how you manage a dropped nucleus, you don't have to have done it yourself. Of course, it's better if you have and you have the personal experience because the examiner asks you, how would you manage it? But as long as you know how to explain the steps in a safe way, even if you have not done it many times, then you can still get away, get away with it. As of course, uh, it's not yet structured into portfolio based, like Mr. Salam was saying. So they have no way to prove if you did the surgeries or not. But the question would still be in a, in a theoretical, you know, imaginary uh, uh, manner. Uh, we have some more questions about uh, people passing the exam in the past. So one, one question, I'll just highlight that, says I passed my part one ICO exam seven years ago, can I still get the clinical exam? Now, this, this, is, the, this is the kind of questions that don't, uh, my advice is better to ask the authority itself this question, because this, it depends one, ex one, one, one area to the other, one, one, one council delivering the exam to another, and it can, it can be different and it can change. So the kind of questions about how many years an exam is valid for is always, always better to get from the website itself rather than having the impression because someone might mistake six years for seven years and give you their own advice. Uh, back to you, Mr. Ghanemi. No, I, th I think that, uh, yeah, let's, because we have some question about working in the United Kingdom. So, and we have an interesting question about if I, if I want to take a first and not working in the United Kingdom. So I think it's time to speak about how to work. In the, what are the rules if someone wants to, to go and work in the United Kingdom? So I think okay. you are in the United Kingdom and you can ask a question for us. Of course. So, um, as, as for working in the UK, it, 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 it depends which grade you want to work at. So, to work in the UK, you need a qualifying basic degree, qualifying, you know, bachelor's in, in, in medicine. Uh, and uh, you will need uh, something to allow you to work in the, the UK, like, like reciprocity, like they call it in the US, or it have different names. So in the UK, you need all you need is a PLAB exam, and you will be allowed to work. Or to make it more generalized, you need a GMC registration. And in order to achieve a GMC registration, you have one of two ways, either doing for the PLAB exam, or doing an acceptable postgraduate qualification. If you get your Glasgow exam done, if you get your Edinburgh uh, exam under your belt, you are eligible to have GMC re registration and license to practice. Now, this registration doesn't say that you can work as an ophthalmologist. It says you are a doctor, you can work in the UK. It, in order to be registered to work specifically as an ophthalmologist, you will need either a CCT, Certificate of Completion of Training, which the trainees in the UK get at the end of training, or a Certificate of Eligibility of, surgic, of, uh, of Specialist Registration, which is the CESAR rule. Now, these are a bit more advanced things that you can aim for. But even without them, even without the CCT or the CESAR, with your basic degrees or even with the Glasgow exam, you can land non-substantive posts in the UK, like specialty doctors, uh, fellows, or even locum consultants. And that's one of the advantages of UK against 
other areas of the world, which that they will still acknowledge your knowledge and your experience and your degrees in ophthalmology, that you can land jobs straight in the market, uh, as, as, as I said. So, why now when we speak about FRCS from now, we, we, it's not, we're, not, we're not differentiating, we're not dichotomizing between the Glasgow exam and the Edinburgh exam. It's in general, why would you go for FRCS? So we started about why in the UK. Why in the UK you get one of these exams? Because it will allow you to skip the class. Most of us are not comfortable studying medicine again, you know, examining a pregnant lady or examining, uh, doing uh, whatever sort of examination, general examination, or even adhering to a, to a patient with, I'm sorry, managing a patient with shock. And um, so most of us won't, would like to come to access working abroad specifically in the UK, using an exam that, that's familiar to them. So the FRC at Glasgow and Edinburgh will give you that. Now, you don't have to go to the UK with these exams. They can certainly help land you jobs both regionally uh, in the Gulf countries, for example, or even in Egypt. And more importantly than all this, they do, I know that people say it, and it does sound like a cliche, but they do make you better clinicians. They allow you to think in order and get take make decisions about about how to manage patients that you might otherwise not have. They put you in a framework of how to think clinically and attack any scenario. Now, the the slide that uh, Mr. Zonemi is sharing now is uh, as well having um, um, uh, some some bits from our local council as well in Egypt. So it applies more to Egyptians that if you hold the FRCS you are eligible to become a consultant after a certain number of years. It's, it's, it's different and it changes as well, but you can certainly apply to become a, a working consultant in Egypt itself. So that's another caveat, why another uh, advantage, why you would want to secure this degree. So it has advantages in Egypt, uh, locally, uh, in the Gulf region, in the UK, or it can allow you to become a consultant as well. I know Mr. Lourini has more information about this. Please share it with us. Well, yes, sure. Uh, and uh, explain us, because yeah, that was an interesting question, asking okay, if I want to take a first and I want to travel. So yes, so this question in this slide is extremely important. You have to ask why you want to take a first yes. <clears throat> I, I completely, completely agree. This can be as a route to go to the United Kingdom, but also other routes for this. Um, I, I, I like the fourth one. Is this the, for you? You are taking the FRCS for you to be a better clinician. Agreed. But yet, in Egypt, what? How can I benefit? I myself, simply when I take the FRCS, I can uh, um, uh, make it an equivalent to the uh, MD, uh, MD exam. Just when I finish a th my thesis defense. So if you have thesis plus FRCS, you can uh, go to the Supreme Council if you, of Universities and get an equivalent uh, MD uh, certificate. So you can bypass the MD exams by this, sim uh, as simple as this, if, 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 you, if you wish for this. So uh, I myself did it, it, it so. So by doing this, by doing the FRCS, you can, you're just seeking for a university that can give you a um, uh, um, uh, pass in the, in the thesis uh, defense, and then you go to the Supreme Council and get the, um, uh, the, the equivalent to the, to the MD. So that's, that's, that's quite interesting and quite important. And also, the F in Egypt, the FRCS exam alone uh, will give you a certificate to be a consultant in the in the medical syndicate. You can be a consultant after a few years of holding the FRCS. It's longer than the MD, but still, it can it can lead to be a, an official consultant in the Egyptian medical syndicate. So you still ha have ha have a, a documentary um, a benefits from the FRCS. Plus, in the private practice, of course, if, if you have the Air Force S and your CV, it's, it adds a much when you go to the, uh, especially the, the bigger names in the ophthalmology uh, uh, private hospitals. They really appreciate the FRCS, like Maghrabi or whatever. Uh, they really appreciate the FRCS and, and putting it for the private sector uh, as, um, as an equivalent to the M. So it's, it's, still, it's still a lot of benefit in Egypt. In Gulf, um, in um, it truly is decreasing, by the way, in Gulf, because previously the FRCS in the previous, I mean, took about more than 10 years, maybe. It was, you can, the, uh, by FRCS alone, get a consultant, but now uh, most of the Gulf countries, they started to, okay, not accepting the FRCS alone. 
If you want to have FRCS, you still have a Western training to be with you. Then be both of us. Uh, so many diff many Gulf countries, they prefer having MD, for example, or even the Egyptian fellowship or the Arab fellowship uh, or, or the Arab board, um, uh, better than the FRCS alone. So still you can use it in, uh, in the Gulf if you have uh, Western training and or again in the private sector uh, in, in the Gulf. But again, I want to repeat what Dr. Mansour has mentioned, that these regulations have been changing frequently. So we strongly recommend that you keep yourself updated, not from how people say or how people tell you. Go to the website of every place, of every official place, like, for example, uh, um, uh, this is the website for the uh, uh, Supreme Council of University in Egypt. Uh, you can go to the website and, and, and check the regulation. You can go to the website of the GMT, go to the website of what country you want to. Please keep yourself updated through the website. What you are seeing today can be obsolete after 48 hours. So you have to keep, to keep updated every now and then of the regulations. We are trying to open windows for you. We are trying actually to talk, uh, I mean, to have like a brainstorming uh, from our experience. How can this help you? So this this what what I, what I wanted uh, to say, uh, to say about this, and um, again about what what is important for you is the way of thinking. I think I, I have seen this in my practice and with many other friends. How when people get some local exams, but when these people start to study for the FRCS and hold the FRCS, the way of thinking in the clinic is completely different. It tends to be really Patient, uh, I mean, patient-minded, uh, systematic thinking. That 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 was very important, and I really like this way. It's the kind of way of thinking because the exam is different than many of the local exams in our countries. So it, it makes us you you really think about the patient, uh, make you have a systematic approach. And let, let us give you an example for this. Dr. Salem, I I like to have um, uh, an example about this. Okay, so. Um... I think, you know, one of the benefits you would see about the FRCS is will make you a better clinician. So this is an example. If I ask you about, a, for example, a patient coming to your clinic, you're in clinic, and you have a 70-year-old patient coming to your clinic with decreased vision, acute decrease of vision. So what could be the cause for this? So again, I mean, possible causes, maybe it's a vein occlusion, artery occlusion, hemorrhage. But the way FRCS helps you to be a better clinician is like this. If you think of the eye like an eye and how the eye sees, light rays falls through the uh, refractive surface, passes through the optical media on the retina and then goes through the optic nerve cares when you see. Same thing, if you can, if you think logically about this, remember in neur neurology where you, they used to say, where's the lesion, what's the lesion? If you apply that, so the lesion could be in the refractive part of the eye, i.e. cornea and lens, or the optical media, cornea, D-chamber, um, lens, vitreous, or it could be sensory, macular versus optic nerve, versus chiasm, or it could be amblyopia or non-organic visual loss. The reason th this way helps you to be a better clinician is like this. If you go to the next slide where I have it on the red, very easy with you can exclude ref, the refractive problem by pinhole and refraction and then optical media problem if you can see well then the patient does not have an optical media problem because you'll be able to spot it and then the third thing uh, is um, sensory and now the question is it macular optic nerve or scans and that's why if you remember in neurology and neuroophthalmology, you always get a visual field for both eyes. Because if you have a visual field in the other eye, the patient is presenting with a problem in the fellow eye, then this is actually it's not a uniocular problem. It's a chiasmal problem. But let's say that you have got a sensory and macula versus it becomes important. Whether the patient has distortion, goes with macula, has RAPD, goes with optic nerve, OCT is helpful. But if you think about it this way, in a minute, or maybe a few minutes, you can reach where is the lesion. Now comes what's the lesion. And that's where the FRCS teaches you is to think now of the 
age of the patient, the sex, bilaterality, and now you start thinking, okay, what's the pathology? We know where is the lesion, what's the pathology? And if you think about it here in the sl next slide, then maybe actually this patient has pseudo exfoliation and the whole IL back complex dislocated. I've seen a patient like this before several times presenting with acute loss of vision. Second, patient may have an optical media problem, be something with the macula, for example, um, you know, wet MD or vein occlusion or artery occlusion, something with a nerve in this age, ischemic optic neuropathy. So the point I'm trying to tell you is that where you, some of the local exams, the emphasis is mainly that you study and recall and you, you need to really study a lot, but you're not using this information. This is not the case for FRCS. FRCS is different. You actually make use of the information. You uh, try to remember it in a way that will help you in clinic. And that's how you become a better clinician. And uh, yeah, that's my point. Uh, Ayman, back to you. So again, it's how, how to think, how to um, organize your thinking. And uh, again, also uh, uh, that in your exam, it's, it's, it's always these two things. When, when yeah, you are asked about, okay, what can cause this, uh, this picture, what can cause this sign, what can cause the symptoms, always thinking two things. What's common and what's dangerous, what's serious. These are the two things that you have to keep looking and have to keep in mind while dealing with, with this. You have to be what's common is common and what's serious is serious. Those are the, always the main things that to think. And always think in differential diagnosis. Think in the possibilities. Don't try to just rush for one diagnosis. This could be this diagnosis. Just try to be just uh, think of the differential diagnosis and just keep it simple. Uh, and it's extremely important not to go for unnecessary medications or unnecessary investigations. Some candidates uh, like have a tendency to uh, order a lot of investigations just to be safe. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, and of course, Dr. Masoud is in the UK now, and also Salam has worked in the UK, and they know how the NHS they're really sensitive on ordering. Uh, um, unnecessary investigation. So every investigation has to be really indicated. So you have to, to make sure while you write down, I will order for this patient like MRI or whatever. No, you have to just define what you are you are ordering. And so it, it, it goes with the same. Um, so let's have this example for instance. Let's have this, uh, uh, this case, for example. Uh, this, this is like one case that I faced in the clinical exam in Glasgow. Um, I mean, you face with a patient, you look at the fundus, so it's very common for a candidate and, and just when you see the fundus like this, say, okay, this is a case of retinitis pigmentosa and thank you. Okay, sometimes the question is, what's the most probable diagnosis for this patient? Or what do you think the diagnosis could be? Again, what's common is common. So what's common is definitely, yes, retinitis pigmentosa, but it's not what this patient has. So the point of what this patient has. So the point is that, please, if you face this in the oral or you face it in the clinical, so just please start by describing the case. You, you start by de de just describe what the case uh, is. So describe the physical finding first. Because if you, if you face a case like this, and type it to me, actually. okay, this is a pigmentosa. So if it's not the case, so, no, it's not the pigmentosa. So you get shocked, you got mental block. So you have to, but if you start describing the sign, which is the right way, you are gaining marks and, and a lot of marks. Like you describe the physical find, findings first and then give the most likely diagnosis. So if in, in this case you just described the, the, the findings, if you can see the picture, that I can see arterial vessels, I can see pig, uh, uh, bones, uh, bones peculiar uh, pigmentations, I can see pale wax disc, I, I can see macular uh, edema, for example, and you are start all this. And so all these findings, uh, most probably this is a case of retinitis pigmentosa. So at that point, you got the full mark, even if the case is not retinitis pigmentosa. You got the full mark because simply you are working in a logic way, you are going to the to what what is really uh, common. One, one other thing: how to describe the picture if you are in the oral, or the patient if you are in a real patient. How to describe the sign? Also, it's very important that some people are trying to just be anatomical only, and they start to describe. But I mean, there is a, an order that, that is really logic most of the time. You start with the positive findings and then the negative findings, and with the positive findings you start with the most important, and then go with the less important. For the negatives, you start with the related uh, related to this case. What, what I mean by this, let's have an example about this. If you can see this picture, 
you can simply start com if you can see this picture in the exam you can simply start with uh, talking about the eyelash i can see um the lid margin is congested a little bit and you can you can you can do it as anatomical as this but but it's not logic that you start with you, you just don't start with an obvious sign that you have in this so if you want to apply what i've just said the positive important is like in the new vessels and the iris this iris new versus the rebiosis is really significant so this could be the first this should be the first thing you mention i can see this this that's the important positive sign then you can go for the less important, like you can have cataract, for example, you can have whatever you want, congestion or whatever. So what I mean by negative related? Negative related, I mean that, for example, you say there's no hyphema. So this is what I mean. I mean a negative point that is not in this picture, on those in this patient, which you are telling the examiner that I have searched for this. Like a case of keratitis, for example, and you say there's no hypopia. So this means that you tried and you looked for this. Then the negative is not related. I mean, you may mention what's normal in this patient, uh, not related. This, this is another uh, another story. I, I wish you got you got my point. So it is how to think. Of course, when you go for details in the further co our further uh, courses, uh, we we will we give you a lot of examples and we have a lot of training for this. So as a golden rule, when you start giving a differential diagnosis, you start with the most common differential diagnosis and the most serious differential diagnosis related to the given data of this particular patient and not as a whole disease. That's extremely important. I know many candidates who fail just because when, I, when they face a case of um, whatever, diabetic retinopathy, and they ask how to manage this patient, they start to recall diabetic retinopathy from, from the book. We can inject, we can do surgery, we can, what about this particular? The question is always about the particular patient you have, <clears throat> the scenario that you have, or the, the clinical, the patient you have in the clinic. What do you think, Dr. Masoud? Do you have any comments about this? I, I totally agree. It's easy in exams. I think we're all guilty of this. It's easy in exams to go into exam mode and just remember that page in the book and start listing the differentials or listing investigations, listing treatment. But that's not how you manage patients. You manage patients by tailoring these options over this patient. So it's not, it's not and I think my friends would agree, it's not about how much you know. It's more about choosing from what you know and presenting it in a in a in a in a in a logical manner, uh, and and allowing uh, and allowing the examiner to know that you have this judgment, you have the knowledge, but more importantly, you have the ca capacity to apply this knowledge over this specific uh, patient. Before we move on, how would you? Um, there's a couple of questions that we can address. Yeah, yeah, uh, if that's all right. So one, one, one question was uh, regu regarding CCT post FRCS, and I, I think my friend, it, it, these two are not quite related. So you get the FRCS because it helps you, like we said, in Egypt or the Gulf, or it helps you to access coming into the UK. Once you are in the UK, you are in a in a whatever great doctor you're working. You can work most most jobs except being a substantive consultant which is like a long-term contract with a consultant in a specific hospital for that you will need either cct or caesar cct is if you join a training job we can deliver certain um, uh, talks in the future about the possibility of that and it's certainly attainable nowadays to join a training job i certainly did and i know other friends a lot now are more and more uh, uh, managing that Alternatively, you can, the other process which is called the Caesar route, which allows you, allows the GMT to recognize you as a consultant, even though you did not finish your training in the UK. And it's basically equating what you know and uh, every, all your knowledge and all your experience, getting proof of it to prove that you are at the same standard as a UK uh, trainee. This is a little bit off the subject, but I'm happy to deliver further side talks. Uh, later on, uh, either as webinars or 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 in 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 courses, um, there is a question I think uh, might uh, might be for you, Ayman. Um, someone is is saying uh, one of my our friends are saying uh, we can can't bypass the MD written and oral exams with FRCS in Egypt, and I think this is a local issue regarding the um, which which comes first, the thesis or the exam. Um, uh, Mr. Ronemi, please lend us your 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 knowledge about this. This is an interesting question because some universe again some universities uh, are not um, are not allowing you to get the thesis before going to the MD exam. So yeah, of course you. Yeah. But again, for the uh, um, again, check the website of the Supreme Council of Universities. 
But the Supreme Council University, if you if you find a, a university that gave you a thesis and you have the FRCS, I think now you can go straight forward for the uh, equivalent MD. And, and the equivalent MD, by the way, is a, a, it fits in everywhere that needs MD. For example, I mean, if, if there is a, 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 a private university or whatever, you, or a, a new coming university asking for uh, lectures, it's usually in the official advertisement. It's, it's uh, okay, the, the, the official announcement in newspapers, it's always asking about MD or equivalent. It's always like this. And, and even um, and even in the uh, um, in, in the Ministry of Health uh, uh, Health Hospitals that has the degree uh, the, the university degree is uh, uh, it's like the uh, general organization uh, of um, of teaching hospitals. Uh, uh, it has uh, there are some jobs in related to the medical uh, so sorry to the academic degree. Uh, the, um, they when they apply for it's not called lecture it's called fellow or zamil. Uh, then it, it asks for MD or an equivalent. And actually, I, I, I took this route. I got FRCS, I got thesis from one university and got to the, to the Supreme Council universities, I got equivalent MD. And when the uh, uh, general organization um, uh, of teaching hospitals um, had an announcement about uh, asking for uh, lectures holding MD or equivalent MD, I applied in 2004. So uh, again, it, it, it's about what university you are holding your MD uh, exam. And still, if you want, you want, you can take both. You can take the exams, the thesis, the FRCS, and you get equivalent. It's up to you. But I mean, the equivalent to MD is almost the same, uh, uh, the same in, in Egypt. Sometimes, some some countries in the region, in the Gulf regions, they specifically ask for what's what's called the hard copy uh, of the university uh, MD. Sometimes they ask. But the, this, the the equivalent certificate from the from the Supreme Council is just a paper with a stamp. It's not a hard a hard a hard copy. Um, some 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 regions, the some uh, uh, countries in the region ask for this, and uh, it has some issues for this. Again, you have to double check because the uh, the regulations are really changing frequently from one country to another, and not all Gulf countries have the same regulations, of course. So I think we'll take one last um, the sorry. regulations for this. There is one last question. Uh, yes, there is one 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 last question about the ICO subspecialty exams and how can it help in the UK or the Gulf areas? Uh, I think they, yeah, m m my knowledge about these exams they're so new, and to my knowledge there is no. Um, I mean, there's they would certainly help you academically, and they would certainly is an extra degree under your belt. But uh, to my knowledge, they're not they're not a requirement in any official. Uh, like training scheme, uh, as 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 far as I know, yes. Um, so the question is: Is it considered as a training program? In general, I think as well, my friend. My my impression: the world is moving more and more towards competency based rather than exam based. So these degrees are are, are very helpful, but it, more and more areas will require that. It's not enough just to pass the exam. It's it's a stepping stone in order to access better training and and working in other conditions, rather than looking at it as a training in its in its own way. Uh, before we uh, finish this up, I I just want to say we are we are we're coming to you. We're speaking to you from three different continents. Uh, so uh, Mr. Ghanemi is currently in Egypt. I'm in the UK, and Mr. Salam is in the USA. And so the question will sometimes come up: Is it worth Going abroad to begin with, or at all, and hence I will uh, I will give the mic back to uh, Mr. Lunemi to uh, to tell us about this interesting photo that he uh, he just shared in the in the presentation. Yeah, so it's always, always a question, and and I, I want a free a free talk and a free thinking. So um, I believe it should be the ideal answer should be individualized, and actually it is one of the <clears throat> of the keywords in dealing with the FRCS exam that I will, it should be individualized. I mean, don't let anyone tell you home is better or abroad is better. Um, it doesn't work like this. Anyone wants to help you should give you the the uh, the information, um, the, inf the the real information for you, and you have all the info in your hand, and then you are the one to choose what are it are am I uh, what what I want to do. Uh, simply, I mean, I can't say that traveling abroad. 
to the kingdom or what, to any kingdom or whatever is definitely better than staying in Egypt, for example. No, no, I cannot say this. Uh, I, 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 I went abroad for 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 Saudi Arabia for time and for some time. I went, by the way, to the GMC registration. I went through the, this path and you got GMC the travel and got the GMC registration, and then I decided I don't want to live in the United Kingdom. So it's it's a matter of preference. I prefer no, I want to, I don't want to uh, to to work in the United States um, and the, the United Kingdom. And I decided that just okay, I, I went for golf for for a, for a period of time uh, for some reasons. In according to you know, the host, my my the hospital I was working in because it was a multinational hospital. So and then I I decided to go back to Egypt. So I, again, working in Egypt has a lot of benefits. Um, it's it's still like if you compare it with the United Kingdom and please, Doctor Abmasoud, uh, counter me if, if, I, if I'm wrong about this. In Egypt, you you still have your private, for example, your your, your private work. You have some freedom in working. Actually, you can work in different places. You can work in governmental country. You can work in private sector. <coughs> you, you you still have some freedom. But I I doubt you have this freedom in the United Kingdom. Please, Doctor Abmasoud, counter me if if I'm wrong. You, you, you're very right. So, uh, as I said, and uh, so th I think this slide shows uh, uh, Salah, uh, the, the very famous Egyptian player playing for Liverpool, although there's not football uh, at all nowadays. I hope you're all safe during this COVID situation, by the way. So, um, but still, he enjoys coming back to Egypt and playing for his home, uh, home country. One thing I always reflect upon, the, the grass is always greener on the other side. Whatever choice you have in life, you will regret not having the other choice. And certainly working in Egypt has many uh, has many advantages. You you have this autonomy. You're less, less abided by sometimes help, very helpful guidelines and sometimes little limiting you in, in orders of what, what you can do or what you can experiment with your patients. Uh, you have more independence and you have more prestige working in your own private work in 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 in, in our own countries or in Egypt, which you can certainly attain in the UK as well. But the first world countries have much more regulation that you need to abide by, and that might prevent you sometimes into flying, uh, you know, high. You would find I always sometimes find as well that we're all the same working in at least in the UK. We're all above average, but you it's 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 not that it's not a system that um uh, that uh, differentiates between people who are not trained well at all or people who are very very well trained which is good in its own way but again it's it's a very it's a very it's a very uh, personal choice regarding what to do and when 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 to do it uh i uh, i want to uh, leave some words as well to uh, mr uh, salam who has worked in the uk for uh, uh, quite a while. There is a bit of lag, so he will he will be uh, joining us by by uh, voice in a few seconds, mm -hmm. telling us UK and even the USA as well. Mm -hmm. Tell you, Dr. Abmasoud, what do you think about this picture and this phrase? It's always greener on the other side. What do you think about this? So yeah, well, uh, no matter where you do, or what you do, or where you go, you will miss the things that you don't get. And there's always things that you, you don't get no matter what choice you do. So um, people in Egypt might be, for example, from my home country, Egypt might be very eager into, to go abroad and to leave the UK, going to the Gulf or going to the UK or going to the USA. And certainly each ambition of that, each endeavor of that will give you a lot. But no matter what you do, it's life. It will take from you as well. And it's easy to always miss what you are not getting. But uh, uh, again, it's it's a tailored and balanced choice uh, that everyone should have. And then once they he or she t makes that choice, try and not regret it and live with it because each each choice, whatever you end up as, uh, uh, has has its own beauty in its in its own way. Okay, uh, Dr. Salam, uh, do you want do you want to share? <clears throat> are, you, are you really eager to hear your your opinion about these two points? <clears throat> home or abroad. You you worked in Egypt, you worked in the United Kingdom, now you are in the United States. So what are your thoughts about this? So here, uh, so FRCS, yes. FRCS gives you, you now. 
a good foundation in terms of you can work abroad, get GMC registration. In England, you can do any job up to a local consultant. And that's all based on your clinical experience rather than the qualifications. So the FRCS gets you registered. Uh, about working elsewhere, uh, you will find that when you work like abroad, it's not only your qualifications, it's actually your overall overall clinical experience and training. And training is more important than the qualification. For example, you know, in certain areas of the US, you can actually have access to work, but you have to be re-qualified. Uh, you have to be like, they have to really like uh, approve your training. They don't look at qualifications, they look at training more. But I think definitely go for the FRCS, better, um, education in terms of how to think about cases makes you a better clinician and gets you good access to the UK system where you can do lots of jobs up to local consultants and then as Ahmed said if you get to the Caesar then you can actually apply for the substantive consultant course and thank you so much Ayman back to you yes life is always greener on the other side as you see from this picture this is a very nice picture but there are pros and cons and back to you Ayman Yes, thank Dr. You. thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's that's that, that. I think I think that's the point that it's always that pros and cons in everywhere, everywhere. Well, just stay in home country, go to Gulf, go to UK, go to the States, whatever. But just our commitment is uh, <clears throat> it's just to let you know <clears throat> uh, all the data that, that we have some experience from for, uh, from us, and uh, just you are the one to take the decision. You are the one to do so. So um, to conclude this, because we exceed an hour, we are planning to have only one hour. Uh, if you have a, a final question, please type in the comments. And in in one minute, we are going to uh, uh, to answer your your, um, your your question about this. But uh, at the end, we would like to announce that please stay tuned. You have, uh, in this page, which is called FRCS Ophthalmology Courses with Experts, we will announce shortly about FRCS courses. Uh, for uh, fi final exams, final first exam, and these courses we will, um, as 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 I mentioned at the beginning of, of our course, we have quite experience about online online courses since the very very early eras. So we believe in that online courses. It's to be different than this webinar. This webinar we have hundreds of people are are, are, see, are seeing us, or and the webinars are hundreds, sometimes thousands of people are, are listening. That's not the proper. Um, way we believe to deliver the experience of the exam and help you really pass the exam. So we decided that we will uh, proceed for FRCS courses. It would be very limited number of seats because we believe it should be one to one. It would be very small groups. So we have a very limited number of seats for this. We would have very small groups with each uh, tutor. So with each teacher, we have very small group where you can teach them. We can, you, we can, we will be able for this short uh, number, with this uh, small number of candidates to teach you one by one, where we can show you some example, a real life example, and make some mock exams, uh, which you show, you show you some picture and ask you to comment, and then we um, uh, we correct you. What, what, what we believe is the most suitable way um, that you comment about this picture and how to answer such questions, how to answer some tricky questions, and also in the clinical sessions, uh, how to examine and, uh, how to answer and go in the comments. So stay tuned that we will announce about the courses very shortly on, the, on our uh, page. So please like the page, share it, and keep uh, keep following it. Uh, Dr. Masoud, do you have any, um, uh, anything uh, you it, like to, to add? Only, Most of the questions, what do you think? I, I, I totally agree uh, that the, the uh, I certainly benefited when I was studying from the one-to-one um, uh, or at the small group uh, uh, attention and, and mock exams and because at the end it is about how you talk, how you speak. Uh, no matter what, I mean, studying uh, uh, from your, getting experience from your patients and studying from books is certainly very useful. But at the end, you need to get into the habit of talking and talking more and talking even more and having lots to say and saying the right thing, not just saying uh, uh, anything. It's just Choosing from what you know, what you should say, and when, and this this needs this needs a fair fair bit of of training 
training, working on yourself, even speaking in the mirror, even talking in the mirror, presenting the patient and presenting the dementia diagnosis and presenting the investigations and management. And certainly if on the other side, rather than a mirror, is someone who is trained to listen and uh, trained to comment on what you said and what's missing, uh, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is certainly is, 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 is very, very, very beneficial. And, uh, and very useful to, for someone who's preparing for the exam. Most of the questions, uh, my friends, uh, Ayman and, and uh, Ahmed, are regarding uh, uh, what, 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 how can we prepare for the exam and advices and things like that, that we either uh, talked about or hinted upon or can be uh, better discussed in further webinars and, and, uh, and discussions and courses. And there would be uh, some polls as well that we would put on the page just to make sure we know our audience and we know uh, we want to listen to you and know what 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 what, what you want. Uh, please, back to you, uh, Ivan. If you want to close up. Yeah, please. I, and for the, our audience, so hopefully we answered you all the questions. Hopefully, um, again, uh, we still believe in the one-to-one -one teaching. So we we are preparing now for interesting courses that that we will speak to one to one. Uh, and. Before I forget, oh, yeah. I just wanted to uh, deliver Mr. Salam's uh, apology regarding the voice. Uh, this is a trial. We're not sure yet which platform we will use for further discussion. Uh, but uh, in all our tests, it was working fine. But that's life. But we are grateful that he did manage to at least uh, speak to us when uh, when given a chance. Yeah, it was, it was for me. It was very interesting meeting meeting friends, meeting meeting my friends, meeting my old friends, and also speaking to the audience from many countries so uh, i wish we had we we got you got any benefit from this webinar i wish so and still we are still together on the page keep connected please keep us keep in touch and keep following the page for the uh, for the announcement for the course thank you adam so from united kingdom thank, thank you, you Mr. Salam. states and i'm talking thank to you from uh, in front of the pyramids actually from uh, <laughs> Egypt. thank you Sphinx. Best thank you in the world Okay, so all right. Thank you, uh, all. We hope you enjoyed it. Yes, I wish I wish you enjoyed this, and uh, let's see see you soon. All right, see you soon. Thank you all for joining, and we'll uh, catch up with you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.